Welcome to this brand new episode of the Beach Side Podcast. I'm your host, HD of the BSB. Like, share, comment, and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Enable notifications to receive all the updates from all the episodes on the, the podcast and the other content on the channel. Follow us on social media, the links in the description and the usernames on the screen. And listen to the podcast on Spotify, Google Podcasts, or any other platform of your choosing. As always, join us for more, and you're always welcome on the episode. Let's kick off the episode by capping Thursday's action, of course, across the board in Europe. And we started the Premier League. Liverpool played Leicester City and Wolverhampton played Arsenal as the rest of round 24 took place. Of course, Liverpool without Sadio Mane and Mo Salah still uh, recovering from the African Cup of Nations. Mo Salah didn't start, really. Um, Sadio Mane was, was out of the uh, out of the list completely, but Mohamed Salah was on the bench. For this one, it was a different lineup for for Liverpool, of course, forced to, as it was the case for the last month or so. Jota started, the new signee, Luis Diaz, started, and I think already proven that he the, his money is really, really worth it for, for Liverpool. Uh, Thiago Fabinho, Curtis Jones were the middle uh, line for Liverpool, and Roberto Firmino started as a striker alongside Jota on the right and Diaz on the left, and it was a game of, I think, not two halves, but I think a game that was different after the first goal for Liverpool. The first half an hour, I think, before the, the goal wasn't exactly that good for Liverpool. In general, not good at all Like uh, in the game. It was really not that productive, um, not that exciting until Liverpool scored the goal from a set piece. Really, I would say, horrendous defending from uh, Leicester City. Too much ball watching in the box and Dugo Jota, like a true predator, uh, pounces on it and scores um, you know, his uh, his first goal in the game and his 11th in the season uh, in all competitions with Liverpool. In the second half, it was more Liverpool pressing. Leicester tried to snatch some counter-attack opportunities, but they couldn't do it. They couldn't get through the defence at the midfield of Liverpool and their sort of final product was not really that good. Diogo Jota, you know, uh, managed his second goal in, this, in the 87th minute after loads of opportunities missing from Liverpool and especially after Salah came off uh, the bench in the 60th minute really added a lot of of sting to the uh, to the attack uh, after the after that game Diogo Jota managed to make it 2-0 for Liverpool in the 87th minute giving them a huge victory uh, uh, as far as they are concerned of course the game in hand uh, they still have and of course they're nine points behind Man City and we don't know what can happen uh, until you know the end of the season really we can't really predict if it's going to be, uh, you know, that that sort of a gap between them is going to be reduced even more by the next coming uh, months. In the Molyneux, of course, it was the only goal that separated Arsenal and Wolverhampton. Uh, the visitors went ahead and took the lead thanks to Gabriel Magalish in the 25th minute. And that was that for the game. Uh, there was no real, I mean, it wasn't that exciting. Um, it was even more boring, I think, than the Liverpool-Leicester game in its in his first half at the very least. Um, the red card was shown for Gabriel Martinelli, of course. Um, that will be a big miss as well for, for Arsenal. But overall, um, they managed to get the win, which is a big, massive three points, I think, as far as Arsenal are concerned. They stay behind West Ham, one point behind them of those top four spots, and that is going to be really, really important as far as the top four race is concerned. Surely now it's it's pretty tight there uh, between uh, West Ham, Arsenal, Man United, and we can say Tottenham, albeit the loss against Southampton, really set them back a little bit. Moving on from England to Spain now, and in the second semi-final of the Copa del Rey, first leg, Athletic Club drawn one all against Valencia at the San Mames. It was Raul Garcia opening the equal, the scoring for Athletic Bilbao before Hugo Duro equalised for Valencia. Of course, the second leg is going to be played next week in the uh, in the Mestalla. In the Copa Italia, of course, we're finishing with some compassion. In Italia, it was Juventus and Fiorentina who go through to the second semi-final of the Coppa Italia after, after the first one was decided yesterday that it would be Milan versus Inter. Fiorentina defeated Atalanta with 10 men away from home, 3-2. to two, A massive victory uh, for Fiorentina to go through to the Coppa Italia semi-final. Piontek give the lead for Fiorentina inside 90 min- 9 minutes from the penalty spot. David Zappacosta equalised on half an hour. Jeremy Boga managed to make it 2-1 for Atalanta, but... 
um, Christoph Piontek back again to score the second and Nikola Milinkovic made it 3-2 in the 92nd minute. That was after uh, Lucas Martinez was sent off from Fiorentina. Um, in the other semi-final, Juventus struggled to beat Sassuolo but a late own goal from Ruan gave them the win against them. Of course, uh, Sassuolo were really, really good in this game, I thought, despite uh, going behind early thanks to Paolo Dybala's goal from Juventus. Does Hamid Traore manage to make it one all inside 25 minutes? But Juventus, I thought the second, the first half was not that good from Juventus, but the second half was really, really good. Uh, Vlavic missed a couple of chances before finally, basically creating the second goal on his own, and uh, you know the ball deflected. But I thought he should have claimed that goal anyway. Juventus managed to make it 2-1 and win this tie and go to the semi-final to meet Fiorentina. The other semi-final, as we mentioned is Milan versus Inter. Let's turn the page now. Let's go to preview some weekend action. We go to the Premier League, of course. We previewed La Liga and the Bundesliga yesterday. Let's take a look now at the Premier League round 25 is this weekend of course it starts with Man United Bay in Southampton on Saturday at Old Trafford Brentford play Crystal Palace uh, Chelsea supposed to be playing Arsenal this weekend but of course Chelsea are at the club World Cup and they played the final in fact uh, on uh, on Sunday Everton versus Leeds United that's on Saturday as well Watford versus Brighton Norwich versus Manchester City and on Sunday it is Burnley Liverpool Newcastle United Aston Villa Tottenham was Wolverhampton and Leicester City play against West Ham United. Some uh, some meaty clashes, I think, for the top four contenders uh, uh, in uh, in the in the table. Let's focus on them before we get to the uh, top table clashes. Of course, um, with Arsenal not playing, I think it's a big chance for the other three: Man City, Man United, sorry, Tottenham and uh, West Ham United. West Ham, of course, the driving seat in this one. They are fourth, and I think let's start from them because I think their match is not going to say the easiest. But I think the most likely to be a West Ham victory. I don't think Leicester have been impressive at all. Obviously, this season, it, it's it's haven't been their best. And Brendan Rodgers is just struggling with everything, it seems, at the moment with Leicester City. Their results is just are just so bad. I mean, at the moment, they really, really horrible as far as their form is concerned. In the last few games or so, I mean, they lost three out of the last five Premier League games that play, and that is considering that they uh, they didn't play like three of them. Uh, they didn't play three other. I mean, uh, they had three games still in hand: Leicester City, of course, against Burnley, against Everton, and against Norwich uh, City. Definitely, uh, you know, games that could help them get into a better shape and better position on the table. But overall, it, it generally doesn't look like Leicester City will achieve. Um, any meaningful position by the end of the season on the table. West Ham United, on the other hand, as I mentioned, in the leading um, seat uh, at fourth table, pretty, I'm going to say comfortable, because it's not. Um, but they're doing a very, very good job. David Moyes is doing a very, very good job as far as West Ham are concerned. He's really drilling them nicely. Uh, they're keeping their shape really well. They have all the requirements, I think, to be a top four side this season. The one thing that probably is going to be missing and probably maybe will put them down is the fact that the squad is is still a bit thin, uh, not that deep uh, like, you know, the likes of uh, Man United and, and Arsenal and Spurs who, I mean, even those other clubs are not exactly deep in terms of squad, but they have more options, I think, particularly on the bench, they have more options probably than West Ham um, would do. But as I mentioned, I think a game for West Ham is pretty winnable uh, and I think, in my opinion, it should be a three points even away from home. It doesn't really matter because Leicester are a bang average this season, whether it be at home or away. And I think their record at home is even worse, Leicester. Um, you know, they're not that far from, uh, from from the table. I mean, they lost four at home this season. Um, you know, West Ham on the other side, um, you know, away from home, his, their record is really, really good, uh, winning six away from home. So I think the form speaks for itself. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, overall, West Ham should be winning this game and I really favour them. Uh, moving on to the side up, 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 up below them, of course, Arsenal not playing Chelsea, as you mentioned. So we go to Man United at six who play against Southampton to kick off this round. 
And Man United are a curious case. Man United, you do not know what you're going to get to them. One week they give you the best version of themselves, another week they give you the worst version against Burnley. And I mean, this this past weekend I think it was the worst version of Man United. Um, I mean, definitely it was not a version that you would like to see as far as Man United are concerned. Uh, the loss against Middlesbrough uh, on penalties, the draw against Burnley, which in the second half was could have been something else, not just a loss. I mean, Burnley Burnley were really, really offensive, surprisingly. I mean, even Burnley, a side that is built on just lobbing long balls up front, when they found Man United sitting on their laurels and regressing back into the defence, they went and attacked them. I mean, that, that shows you, I think, how bad Man United can be under Ralf uh, Ragnick. But, and Southampton, of course, come in from a couple of good results as of late as well. I mean, definitely a side that is... Should be gaining confidence, I think. The win in the uh, the win, of course, in the in the FA Cup against Coventry City, defeating Tottenham away from home at Tottenham Hotspur Stadium, three to two, uh, and the general, I mean, general form, I thought, and and general performances from Southampton are really, really good at the moment. So they can throw a spanner in Man United's work, and I think it's not going to be surprising at all if they defeat them even at home, because you know Man United are not exactly do not exactly have um, you know standards uh, to their game at home or away really you just wait for the game itself and you see what they're going to be playing uh, like um, we move on to Tottenham of course who have a big clash directly uh, against their uh, against the side behind them on the table a side that could actually overtake them on the table if they w- if they defeat them at home it's Tottenham versus Wolverhampton at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium and both sides coming from losses Wolverhampton losing to Arsenal to the north to the other North London side. Spurs losing to Southampton at home. Both sides losing at home. Uh, this is going to be a game, I think, where the winner is going to get a bit of advantage over the other. Obviously, Wolverhampton, I think, but have been doing a really good job. I thought Bruno Lage has been going under the radar as far as his side is concerned. Um, you know, losing at Amatoriori in the transfer window might be a big blow uh, to their sort of project, but I think overall Bruno Lage has done a good job with Wolverhampton. They're still within a shout, I would say, of winning the, uh, the one of the top four spots. They still could fight for your, for a European spot this season, so I think Wolverhampton, uh, you know, will try and try and force the issue like Southampton did. Um, you know, Tottenham were worryingly average in that game against uh, against Southampton for all the praise they were getting um, for being for being more intense under Conte, for running more, for doing more effort. I thought you know Tottenham were pretty poor against Southampton. The second half could have ended with four or five goals for Southampton uh, as Tottenham really regressed in, in that game anyway. Um, you know, their form in general, I mean, after starting really strong, I think, under Conte, then, of course, the losses in the Carabao Cup, the loss against Chelsea in the league, um, and then, of course, against Southampton again in the league, the undefeated streak just, you know, turned into a winless streak uh, almost for, for Antonio Conte, but I think this is a game even as tricky as it is, I think it's a big chance for Conte to rectify his path and, and really go for it, I think, as far as uh, as Tottenham uh, are concerned. Of course, elsewhere in the uh, in the round, Everton play against Leeds United. It, they're not in a good form. The Toffees under Frank Lampard at the moment, um, despite the fact that it's a new manager, but it's a direct head-to-head competition. Everton in particular really worried about going into the relegation zone. They don't want that to happen. Um, and Leeds United, on the other hand, hand they also want to improve their finish in the season Watford versus Brighton and Hove Albion Brighton of course who also look to improve their position on the table at ninth Watford who want to avoid relegation by any price but it looks like they're not going to be doing it and maybe they'll sack Roy Hudson on the way out as well Man City in a supposedly easy game against Norwich City away from home albeit the Liverpool fans I would think they will hope for Norwich City to put a spanner in their works and and really uh, you know end the the, the the streak for them and and put them um, you know and and put them back a little bit to allow Liverpool to get some points. B- Liverpool who play Burnley away from home as well. This is I think a much harder game for for them than Man City's uh, game against Norwich City. But definitely they will need the points. They won't really play around. I think they will start the I think they will start the best lineup. Albeit they have a Champions League game against Inter Milan coming. 
but I really doubt that they're not going to be starting the best lineup, trying to gain advantage and gain some ground behind Man City before that Champions League game happen. Newcastle playing Aston Villa, of course. Uh, that's on Sunday and on Saturday. It is Brentford versus Crystal Palace. To Italy now, and it is round 25 of Serie A, of course, taking place this week. And after some cop action, interesting cop action um, on the midweek, we back to Serie A uh, on the weekend. Lazio play Bologna on Saturday. Napoli host Inter in a massive game uh, on Saturday uh, afternoon. Torino host Venezia. Milan play Sampdoria that to kick things off on Sunday. Empoli, Cagliari um, on Sunday as well. Genoa, Salernitana, Elas Verona, Udinese, Solo play Roma. Atalanta play Ventus in another massive game as far as the top four spots is concerned. And Spezia play against Fiorentina to finish off the round on on Monday, obviously, I think three games are the focus in this one and definitely deserve a lot of attention here. The first one, of course, is Napoli playing Inter on uh, on, on Saturday. To be fair, the last weekend for Inter Milan wasn't exactly a pleasing one. They lost a derby against Milan, 2-1, to one, one point. They're now ahead of them, of course, a game in hand. Let's put this always into perspective for Inter Milan, a game in hand. Um, so at the worst of cases, uh, they, they could lose this one and still win their game in hand and will still have some advantage on the table. But you don't know what could happen, really. In the rest of the uh, of the season, it was only the second loss for Inter last week against AC Milan, and they didn't look. I mean, they didn't look particularly sharp in this one. But obviously, every team has a day off, and Inter Milan have been so strong. I think this season that I'm not going to say they're allowed a day off, but at some point, you know that they will have a bad match or two. Uh, but they managed to sort of turn it around in the cup, of course. They beat Roma uh, 2-0. It was a pretty comfortable game, uh, as far as they are concerned. And they get in this one against Napoli with, with obviously, massive hopes. I mean, it's an away game, but I think for Inter Milan this season, it doesn't matter. They really have to put a lot of effort into this one. Napoli will find this the perfect opportunity to pounce and to get... Uh, you know, back at um, at Inter Milan and to get the top of the table spot that they want to. Of course, they've been hovering around. They started the season pretty strong, but then they just wavered off into the distance. In the reverse fixture, of course, they lost 3-2 to two in the uh, Giuseppe Miazza, so they would want to avenge that as well. Um, in the last four games uh, between these two sides, in the last five even league games, Inter Milan have won three uh, or won four and drawn only once in the last five encounters, of course. Um, Napoli, I mean, they, the, the last time, I mean, they didn't lose in the last five games they played, uh, you know, at their own uh, at their own home in the formerly known as the Sao Paulo, now the Diego Armando Maradona Stadium. At least they have advantage in that, so they can maybe rely on their sort of home record, good home record to, to, to win. But of course, they can't rest on their laurels, of course. Um, they, there will be, uh, obviously, there will be no Koulibaly, although the other players uh, have returned. Andrei Zambongisa, Victor Osimhen has returned, of course, and scored last week uh, for Napoli, which is going to be a big plus, because they will need someone like him uh, in a game like this, scoring against Venezia, of course, in, in the three points that they got. And their form has been pretty good uh, in, in the league as of late. I mean, two losses in, in seven games in the league is not exactly the worst thing in the world, but obviously, when you're still one point behind Inter, is it's really going to be, um, you know, every game will matter for you and every three points uh, will matter for you. Inter Milan, I don't think they will change anything um, in, in the way they play. They will go about their game the same way. It's Napoli, I think, who have the most of pressure to try and take down Inter Milan. But I think if... Um, if Luciano Spalletti plays it calm, plays it collected, plays it cool, and he knows what to do and manages the game really well, I think he w he can get a good result out of Inter Milan, maybe even win. And again, it's home for him. The game is at home, so it's advantage for Napoli to try and, and take the three points uh, home. Another side that is going to be going to be interested in this in the outcome of this game is AC Milan, who plays Sampdoria on Sunday uh, lunchtime kickoff. But obviously, the game between Napoli. And Inter will have direct repercussions for AC Milan. The result there will affect them. I mean, they will need to win. They will have to win, obviously, their game anyway. They, they can't really care much who wins in the Napoli Inter game um, because they need to win their games first. Obviously, 
they play but after that game so there will be pressure for Milan heading into that clash against Sampdoria if the results for example Inter win and and get the gap going to four points and Milan have to catch back again but I think Milan have have a record I think as of late maybe in the last two seasons of winning big games then falling in the small ones I'm not saying that Sampdoria is a small game necessarily or an easy game for Milan but this is one that could be tricky Sampdoria's position at the table is pretty rough uh, at 16th with 23 points this is a side um, that really was impressive last season they were hovering around the Europa League spots they were definitely able to to get a European spot by the end of last season but they couldn't um, Sampdoria you know again not exactly a game where Milan should be taking it easy and playing it comfortable and again Inter Milan uh, just linking with this game Inter Milan have another game to think about of course which is the Liverpool one as they host Liverpool in the in the Champions League so I think the the bodies of the players will probably be in Napoli but the minds will be in Milan preparing for that game against uh, Liverpool so Milan maybe they'll find themselves in a really good situation maybe this will be the perfect weekend for for AC Milan winning against Inter win against Lazio 4-0 on the cup and then they find themselves maybe potentially on the top of the table maybe a draw between Napoli and Inter and Milan win and they find themselves top of the table so that's going to be definitely a big game uh, for, for AC Milan even if it is played against a 16th place side in the table um, Atalanta versus Juventus is the third big game I say for the weekend of course and this is a direct uh, fourth sport sort of battle between Atalanta and Juventus Atalanta haven't been impressive as of late. Their under their winless sort of streak continued with a loss against Fiorentina in the uh, in the Coppa Italia. Their performances of late haven't been impressive at all. Their performances have been impressive. Gasparini is certainly under a lot of pressure to try and take this game. Um, you know, and try to take the, the win these games and and get the fourth spot again for Atalanta. I mean, at one point they were close to the 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 top pack, of course, Napoli, Milan, and Inter, and now they're just. I think I'm not going to say too far, but I think they're pretty far behind when it comes to uh, to the, the chasing the Serie A title. That is, I think, long past gone as far as Atlanta are concerned. They only have the four spot to, f to to figure out. Juventus, as I mentioned time and time again, they're not impressive. They're not the smoothest side. Maybe they're not even the best side playing football. They have their own flaws. They have their own problems. But in the end. I think as of late and in the last two months or so, I think they know how to get the job done. They do it with the minimum of fuss, I would say. Not exactly a flamboyant result. Okay, the, the result against Sampdoria in the Cup 4-1 may be an exception, but I think they will get the job done anyway. Their form is really good as of late, and you can't help but think Juventus get into this one with better sort of momentum, uh, not just because they qualified in the Cup and Atalanta didn't, but also because their overall form in the last two months is pretty, pretty good. They only lost against Inter in the Super Cup in the last two months or so, in like 12 game span, which is really, really impressive when you think about it. Um, Juventus made get into this one, as I mentioned, with a better form and more momentum. Atalanta will really need to be, I think, tight on this one and maybe also find their scoring boots because they were uh, because they're not finding those uh, those as of late uh, really um, you know three games in the league without win a cup loss against Fiorentina at home uh, against a 10 man side um, it it really does feel that that bad I think as far as Atalanta are concerned so definitely it will be a big one to watch as well this is going to be an interesting weekend I think as far as Serie A is concerned maybe we can say that this is going to be a sort of title deciding and we will see is it going to be Inter or is it going to be a triple threat race until the end in Serie A To finish off, we move on to Africa. Now it is the return of the Champions League. The Carl Champions League returns this very weekend and it starts on Friday. Of course, three games um, will take place on uh, on Friday. Uh, let's talk about the groups, of course, in general, four groups as usual. This is going to be the last edition, apparently. Of the CAF Champions League starting next season, it will be played in a Super League model. Um, apparently, 16 teams or 20 teams, I think, will be um, would be uh, playing in uh, in the in this competition, and apparently, it will be played in a Super League system. Two groups. 
uh, and after all, um, it will be decided who's going to be going through uh, anyway. So it will be uh, the last edition of the CONF Champions League, and it features four groups, as you mentioned. Group A features the champions, of course, Al Ali, two time back to back. Uh, champions overall 10 times uh, winners of this competition play with Al Halal and Al Marikh from b both from Sudan and Mamelody Sundowns from South Africa. Group B of course is Amazulu uh, from Zambia, US City from Algeria, Horoe from Conakry and Raja Casablanca from Morocco. Group C um, with Bilwizdad from Algeria, Esperance Tunis and Etoile, Le Sportif du Sahel from Tunisia and Galaxy FC from Eswatini or uh, formerly known as Botswana, and Group D is Petro de Luanda from Angola, Sagrada uh, Esportivo uh, from uh, from uh, from Angola as well, uh, Wadad, Casablanca, uh, and Zamalek from Egypt. Um, I'm not going to say a lot of things. I mean, I will leave it, I think, until the first round is played, because obviously you can't really talk about African football in the same way about European football, because I don't really watch a lot of other leagues in, in Africa as much as, uh, as I need to. Um, but of course, we will leave things until the first round is over. We'll talk about it on Saturday, Sunday, hopefully, when the round finishes with games games being taken place on Friday and on Saturday but just give a quick I think preview and predictions as far as each group uh, are concerned I think group A might be just the toughest I think of them all Al Halal, Omar Marikh, Al Ahli, Anderson and Sundowns three former champions of course of the African Cup of Nations or the Champions League sorry um, you know amongst those group of course Al Ahli should be I think a boys to go top of the group uh, currently playing in the, uh, in the FIFA Club World Cup they're not going to be playing their game at the moment they'll play it in uh, on March 5th against Al Marikh at, at home remember these sundowns play Al Halal Um Durman on Friday in South Africa I think it's going to be a tough start for Al Halal and for Al Marikh Al Marikh similar to the way they started last campaign against Al Ahli in Egypt they will start this one again in Egypt um, Al Ahli from, from that group as I mentioned I think Al Halal Al Ahli should be poised to go through um, as second I think it's going to be between um, between Al Marikh and Sundowns I really doubt Al Halal will have any significant role in this group but it might be proven wrong anyway in group B Amazulu uh, ASCD for Roy Conakry and Roger Casablanca uh, I think Roger Casablanca and Steve might have a big chance of going through. I don't think that Amazulu or Horoya will put much pressure. Horoya might do so. They're really a decent side quarter-finalists last season, but I don't think Amazulu will will be any problems. Maybe they'll be the basket of the points. I mean, they're top of the group at the moment just because their name starts with A, basically, um, but they can't be really bothering uh, those two big, big sides. Of course, yes, Sadif and Roger Casablanca, both former champions. Steve won it back in 2014. Uh, in Group C, the groups that I'm really interested in the most, obviously, because my side, Esperance Sportive Tunis, a side that I support, is into it. Um, after last season's, let's say, bad result against Al Ali, bad exit from the semi-final, um, with a pretty pretty bad performance in both games, uh, definitely entering the Champions League this season with loads of hopes to try and regain some momentum. Obviously, new coach and new mentality, and I'm really waiting for these kind of opportunities to judge the coach, uh, Radhi Jaidi, former Esperance legend. Of course, they start against Galaxy. Um, it's going to be on Saturday, and it was Sportif du I'll start against Bilouzdad today on Friday. That's going to be uh, in on on uh, on Friday. It's going to be played at Radis uh, in the Hamadi Agribi Stadium in the Group B. Roger Casablanca play against Amazulu on Saturday, and Arroyo play against Steve as well. That is on Saturday. Uh, Group C, as I mentioned. I am waiting for it to follow Esperance to see how they will start in the Champions League. I generally think they should be able to top this group. Uh, I, I'm, 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 I'm not exactly impressed by Litwal's performances in the league, although I, I hope for them to qualify as a Tunisian. I hope for them to qualify alongside Esperance. So I, I, I will be very emotional on this one, and I will say Esperance top, and it will be second in this group. Bill's dad will be third, and Galaxy will be fourth, although, as I mentioned, surprises could happen, and you don't know what could pop up in this group. As far as Group B is concerned, um, I don't have a lot to talk about. I think Willard Casablanca will be first, and Zamalek will be second. I really doubt Petro Luanda or Sagrada Esportivo. Uh, Esperanza will do uh, will do anything. Zamalek, of course, plays against Athletic Petrolios uh, tomorrow, and Willard Casablanca will play against Sagrada 
Real Esperanza uh, are today uh, at 8 p.m. in Morocco. So I will leave it all, I think, on Sunday after the first round finishes. We'll do a CAF Champions League Road uh, kind of video and we'll talk specifically about what happened in uh, in that round overall. I'll try and, and get into more details, I think, to what happened uh, in the first round. That's it for this episode. Like, share, comment on the YouTube version, of course, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Always enable notifications to help us uh, and receive all the updates from these episodes and all the content on the channel. The usernames on the screen for social media, follow us there. And of course, the links in the description. Listen to the podcast on Spotify or any other platform. And until next time, I was your host, HD of the PSP. Take care and goodbye. I ain't